Hello and welcome to The Mill. I am your host, Dusty Crane. Today we are going to be talking about Scythe, all things Scythe actually. I am going to go ahead and do the video I keep getting asked to do and that is a strategy video. Before I get into strategy though, I want to talk a few news items. This has started arriving for Stonemeyer Champions. The pre-orders, the first 1900 have started shipping and they're starting to show up at people's houses so get excited it's uh looks like a pretty cool expansion i am going to actually do what jamie asked and i am going to go into this site unseen i still have the cards inside and shrink and i'm just going to go ahead and break them out during our next game of scythe the second piece of news is unfortunately kind of a bummer um in the facebook live chat jamie did this past wednesday Someone asked about the status of the modular board, and he told us that the deadline came. He was talking with Jakob, and Jakob notified him that he was going to miss the deadline. He hadn't actually done much of the art at all. It is now going to transition. The art is going to transition from Jakob to Jamie's graphic designer, who's going to go ahead and do what he can and you know put it together, and then he's going to send it back to Jakob for some polishing. So to me, that seems to indicate that maybe they're going to reuse some of the art that we already have on the map, and just that's how things are going to get swapped out. That's just a guess. I, I don't know for sure, but that's kind of what I'm thinking. It's kind of a bummer because I think that's going to push out that modular board longer or further away than what we were thinking, but I mean, at least we're still getting it. So that is a reason to, to uh, celebrate. Before I get into the strategy, last week I meant to mention that the mill reached 250 subscribers, and that is a super cool, um, a super cool milestone for me and for the channel. I totally forgot to mention it and just looked before this video, we're at almost at 300. That's super cool. Maybe by the time you see this, we are at 300 or past 300. In any case, really the whole purpose was just to let you know if you've given us even 20 seconds of your time or a minute or one video, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Without further ado, let's get into strategy. But before we do, let me set expectation. I didn't get this gig because Jamie thought I was a great scythe player, all right? I'm not. The majority of my games are played against my son. He's 15, and he I'd say we split the games about 50-50, but I don't think either one of us would stand much change in a tournament. Um, we kind of just have fun, and so... I just want to set the expectation. I am not going to set your world on fire with these, these strategies or these tips. Um, so I, I apologize in advance, but I did scour BGG strategy. I did watch Jamie's past videos on scythe strategies, and I also watched some videos that the community have put together. And, and so I'm just going to go ahead and present I'm going to do just kind of high level. This is going to be general strategy. I, Depending on how this is received, you know, I can go down into the, the factions and present some of those strategies. But let's start super general. Um, I got my list here. I'm just going to go ahead and consult. Another thing to set expectation is I don't like playbooks. I don't like the strategies that say on turn one, do this. On turn two, do that. And it kind of lays out the first 20 turns because on average a game of scythe lasts between 18 and 22 turns according to um, a really incredible strategy guide i found on bgg by a bgg user who goes by manhattan jack and that's john martorana and hopefully i pronounced that right but he has an incredible multi-piece strategy blog and he mentioned that scythe well yes it is a 4x game or action selection game it's also a race. Each game of scythe on average is between 18 and 22 turns. Getting back to that, not liking to do turns. Um, I remember being in high school and a game that I liked to play back then was a game called Starcraft. It's on the PC and looking at the strategy blogs, they mentioned, you know, um, to do a Zerg rush or a Terran rush, here's what you do. And it was step by step by step. And I found myself playing every single game exactly the same way. And I don't think you want to do that for side. If I tell you, you know, turn one, build, turn two, produced, you know, it doesn't need to be that static. And I think if you actually get in the mindset of it being static like that, that 
it's going to be, it's going to hurt you in the long run. I think what I really like about Scythe is it's not in isolation. You're not playing a game by yourself. You have to respond to your circumstances, whether it's your faction matter, your player board, or your opponents, or, you know, what, what they're encountering, or, you know, combat. All of these things play into how you play the game. And so let me start with Jamie's strategies. He has some basic strategies that are laid out on the quick start card in the box of Scythe, and it's great. I mean, it is, if it's the very first time sitting down to play Scythe, it gives you an idea of things to do. Um, I think maybe the first tip is a little geared towards somebody who's sitting down at a table with a bunch of other friends that are playing this for the first time. Because the first tip that Jamie offers is take an action that no one else at the table has taken yet. I think that's great for pushing buttons and seeing what your player mats do and what your, your action selection does. But ultimately, I don't think it's competitive. I don't think if if everyone else trades on their first turn that you want to necessarily bolster. Take the quick start card, use it, understand that I think it is more geared towards just poking buttons and, and seeing what happens when you do what. Jamie was on a YouTube video a while back talking scythe strategy, and I, I took note of those. I was going to say advanced strategy. I don't think it necessarily qualifies as that, but... Um, a few of the things that he called out were, um, at the start of the game, consecutively trade and produce to get your bottom row action on your second turn. I think that is a good idea. I think that is a good idea because so much of Scythe, and it, especially with it being a race game, so to speak, is you want to get those bottom row actions as much as you can. So much of the strategies that you read online and so much of watching how people that are good at the game play is building an engine that you can knock off those bottom row actions one after another after another after another is ultimately pretty important if you want to be competitive inside. I mean, you don't want to have too many wasted turns when you only have 18 to 22 turns to play. Um, so the first one that Jamie offered was at the start of the game, consecutively trade and produce to get your bottom row actions going. The second one is try to aim for five workers to keep spending down and get more later if necessary. Now anyone who plays Scythe knows that the sweet spots are three workers, five workers, and seven workers. And the reason for that is once you put bring out your fourth worker, you incur a penalty or a cost. Now instead of it being free to produce, you are also paying a power. Once you have um, the next tier out is you're paying popularity. And finally, once you have all your workers out, you're paying power and popularity and coins to get that production out. Now, yes, you also achieve a combat star, or I'm sorry, not a combat star. You do also achieve a star towards your objectives, but not towards your objectives either. I'm using all kinds of terminology that I shouldn't. It is a way to get a star, is <laughs> getting your, your eight workers out there. Jamie mentions that for him, the sweet spot is five workers. I think for me, more often than not, it's five workers. So that's his number two. Try to aim for five workers. Number three is ignore objective cards if they don't fit into your to your strategy. I think that's great advice. I, I, there's some objective cards that say, become a pacifist. You know, there's also objective cards that say, become a despised warmonger. These two things are wildly at odds with each other. And if you're looking at your mat and gaining power is not going to help you achieve your, your goals or gaining popularity isn't going to help you achieve your goals, then maybe you just ignore that at all. And that's important. Feel free to discard any part of it that, or not use, any part of it that is not going to ultimately aid you in and continuing on. The next one presented was spread out across the board, particularly with workers because it slows down other players. Now, one of the functions of the workers being on the board is once a mech or a character enters a territory with a worker, their movement stops. Whether they have a, whether they have a speed mech out, if they enter a territory with a worker, they stop. They also take a popularity hit. So, it's a nice way to slow them moving across the board while you have minimal impact to you. I mean, yes, your worker is back at your home base. You got to get them back out there again, but 
that popularity hit could be beneficial to you at the end. The fifth and final strategy Jamie provided in that YouTube video was to continue taking bottom row actions even after you have got the star or um, upgraded them to reap all the benefits. So if you got all your recruits out and or you've recruited everyone and you have a three coin benefit to recruiting, keep doing it. I mean, it doesn't matter if you do the recruit, recruit action five times, six times, seven times, you're still getting the reward for that. You're still getting the, the three coins or the two coins or you know, if you're just trying to take the that to get an extra combat card or whatever it is, you can still keep taking those actions even if you don't gain the benefit that they would have otherwise provided. So you can still get, you know, the, the three coins or the two coins even if you're not adding a new recruit to, you know, your board. So um, that's something that some folks don't know about. You can absolutely keep deploying mechs even if you've already got four on the board. Next, I'm just going to go ahead and I've just got some bullet points here that I'm that I'm going to run through and kind of give you an idea of maybe some of the strategies I found surrounding those particular items. Stars. Stars are ultimately how you bring about the end game, how you end the game. They're not necessarily how you're going to win the game. Depending on your popularity tiers, those stars are worth varying coin amounts you know in the lowest popularity tier a star is worth three gold the next one four the next one five that means if your opponents are in the lowest popularity tier you doing one bottom row action that is your three coin bottom row action if you have one financially it's the same thing it's not going to bring about the end game but if you have more coins at the end of the game i mean that's how you win somebody who has you know, three stars out can beat somebody who deployed their or put their six star out and ended the game. So stars are not the end all be all. I mean, if you see somebody putting down their third or fourth star and you only have one, yes, start going about earning those stars in whatever fashion you can. There's no reward for getting most of your mechs deployed or most of your recruits. There's no end game benefit to getting seven of your workers out. So keep an eye on that, but also know that stars are not the end all be all. The next piece of advice I found or the next strategy I found was encounters. They are of varying importance depending on where you're at in the game. Early in the game, encounters are very important. They provide great resources. I was cautioned in one of those strategy guides to not underestimate popularity, and so a lot of the times the cost, the very expensive cost on the encounter card comes with a popularity hit. It may be hard, depending on where you're at at the game, to climb back out of that hole. So if you're getting it earlier, you have a little bit more time to, to do that. But remember early on that the encounters are worth more, and as you go on and as your engine gets built and you're you're gaining more and more things from a, from a build action or from a, uh, from a produce action then those encounter cards become less important. The next one I found was mechs. When I started playing Scythe, and even really as recently as the last time I played, before I was reading these strategy guides, is I kind of thought, this is a race to get out your river mech, your river walk mech. Get that out there as soon as you can so you have more mobility. That might explain why I've been so bad at playing Crimea, because they are one of those factions that you can really do a lot from inside your home base and there are maybe better mechs to start first. The The strategy guide I read from Manhattan Jack mentioned, it seemed like a lot of his, his suggestions were actually built around getting that speed mech out first. And the reason being is once you start building workers, you want to be able to get those workers around quickly. Once you have your full accompaniment of workers, however many you're going to build, you want to be able to move them around the board quickly. So having that speed mech, being able to move, you know, further and faster, especially in a race game is, is very important. All right. The factory, the factory is very popular for very obvious reasons. You get a very popular, or I'm sorry, a very powerful factory card. You also get three territories if you end up there at the end of the game. But you don't always need the factory. Yes, it is nice to have at the end of the game. 
you don't always need a factory card. So my advice that I found regarding the factory card is if you're going to go there, earlier the better probably. I'm sure there's circumstances where that's not necessarily the case. But if you're going to go, go early so that you have your choice of what factory card you walk away from. Toward the end of the game, you know, if you're the last one to the factory, you've got the leftovers that no one else wanted, and chances are they didn't want them for a reason. Not to mention, the factory card usually substitutes or does what a second row action does anyway, and so maybe you've already got your stuff built. Maybe you've already got your, your buildings built. Maybe you've already got your workers built or your mechs deployed. The factory card too, I think, is probably one of those things like encounters that you could say is worth less more worth less further into the game. Not always true as of every strategy, but I think that's probably that's probably pretty good advice. The last one I've written down is enlistments. Don't sleep on the enlistments because not only do you get a bonus for putting them out, but every time the person on your left or your right takes that action, whether you take the enlistment for building, every time they put a mech out, you get that benefit. And yes, it's true for you too that if they've already built all four of their mechs and they take that build action again, you still get that benefit. Even just because a mech's not going out on the board doesn't mean that you're not getting that enlistment bonus. This is all pretty high level and a lot of you that play Scythe regularly are probably, you know, nodding your head and thinking, yeah, that's all pretty obvious, but it's not. If you're new to Scythe or you have played with a very limited group and you are pretty successful in your group, then, you know, maybe there's not much reason to pursue strategy, but it's pretty exciting. It's one of those things I like about Scythe that I can have played 30 or 40 games and think that I know what I need to know and still, you know, break open one of these strategy guides and read and, and think, wow, I did it all wrong. I, I don't need to break it down turn by turn by turn by turn, but I can, you know, find common ground with some of these tutorials and say, hey, when I am playing, um, when I am playing, you know, Rusviet or I am playing Polanya, this is, you know, something I can do to maximize what I'm doing. I don't have to do turn one, turn two, you know, step by step by step, but I can, you know, take the best practices and improve my game. So I'm going to point you in the comments, in the show notes to Manhattan Jack's awesome blog. There is so much good stuff there. Um, check that out. If you want something more faction related, um, there's a BGG user out there, Jay Kamer, who has put together posts that are based on the different factions. That's another great one to read. I will, like I said, depending on how this is received, you know, go into a deeper dive for each individual, you know, faction. Thanks for watching this video. If you have anything else related, if you want to discuss, you know, did I give a bad piece of advice here? Did I say something that doesn't make a lot of sense or you think makes sense but maybe needs a little bit more um, explanation, feel free to drop in the comments. If you have a good strategy video or a good strategy blog that you think that I could benefit from or anyone viewing could benefit from, feel free to include that too. I Again, thank you so much for watching, for liking and subscribing. Um, if you're not subscribing and you like what you see here, go ahead and click subscribe, click the bell to get notified. and. That's all I got for you today. You guys have a good one. Thanks. Bye.